Hello everyone and welcome to another Toon Boom video. This time I'm going to talk about colouring your animation or your drawings in this software. It's a little different to other software so you've got to get used to the way how it works to start with but it's not too complicated and then we're also going to throw in a couple of extra useful tips that I find um, you know massive time savers especially when I'm doing hand-drawn animation so have a watch and see if you can pick up a few handy little bits of information. So you can see on my screen that I have an illustration here, a little drawing that I've done as an example. You can see there's an underdrawing where it's in kind of like a light sort of blue pencil. This is kind of to replicate the old fashioned blue pencil, uh, you know, a non photo blue pencil that they used to use when it was all on paper. And I've done that on a separate layer. They're, you can slap me on the wrist here. This is just called drawing and drawing one. Um, ideally, you should name your layers correctly, but this is just a quick demo, so hopefully you'll forgive me. Now, I could just delete this. Um, if I want to keep this, this drawing for later, I can hide it if I want to with these little googly eyes that are... I love it how they kind of... the ones here follow you around. But you can just hide it. Or if you do want to um, keep it and you want to... You know, there's, I don't know, maybe you've drawn it on the same layer as the actual black uh, line artwork. You can just double click the color itself and open up the sort of swatch you created for it, which we're going to go over in a second. And you can lower the alpha all the way down to zero. This is something I do when I want to remove a rough um, and I'm kind of like, if I'm maybe doing a couple of different versions of roughs, I'll just change the color by adding a different swatch and then I'll lower the, the alpha of the, the first one so that I can gradually like tie down my roughs as I go through it. So this is a useful little tip. Um, and obviously you've got all the way up to fully opaque on this side. So you can just um, hide this if you want to, which I'm going to do for now so we don't get confused. And then I'm going to click on this drawing so it's active. And we're going to talk a little bit about um, using color in here. So how do we color things in Toon Boom? Well, the default mode is vector. That's the default format when you create layers. We've got another video on that about um, bitmap or vector on this channel. But basically, you can use bitmap if you want. That kind of paint palette works a lot more like a traditional artist palette. You can mix the colors together. You can pick from them. It does save some swatches. Um, what I'm, when I'm talking about swatches, I'm on about these little color little uh, rectangles along here. It saves some presets, which you can click and then quickly bring back but um, it does mix everything together whereas vectors you have to have individual colors there's no option to mix something on the fly um, just quickly if you need to and these colors are all tagged with IDs which the software recognizes so for example this black line if I was to double click this swatch and we're in the color tab don't forget here if I was to double click that and change this color. It's going to change every instance, as they call it, everywhere on the software, on, on your scene, where this color is used. Um, I want to color my umbrella these two different colors for each panel, so I have to create two different swatches. Now, when you are creating colors in Toon Boom, by default, you just click this little plus on any of these, with any of them selected, to be honest, because as soon as you click it, it will just duplicate the one you've got um, it's separate, so if you change the color of, if you were to color one panel with this, and then I was to change this one, it's not going to have an effect because they are no no longer linked together when you create a new color. Okay, so if you click the plus, you can use that as a guide to create your new color. Now, one of the things that's really handy is knowing that these little what they call radio buttons give you different ways of looking at the colors. So find your personal preference. I know somebody who likes this version for me. I cannot get my head around it. I like to use um, the H version over here because I've got this nice easy to read slider and then I can move it around. There's your alpha slider as we discussed before and there's lots of other things to play around with. You can rename in here. You can also click this multiple wheel mode which is absolute insanity. So as you move this thing around everything else moves um, you know, some people want that level of control. For me, single is just about enough for uh, for my head to 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 cope with. So you can change those, and you can rename, like I said, in there, or you can just click on double click on the actual title here and call it something else. 
So you've got a couple of options there. So remember to rename things according to what they are going to color as opposed to the color itself if you want a simpler way of understanding what you are doing. Now the final tip, and this is a really handy one if you don't know it already, is um, maybe you don't want to color your color on the same layer as the line art. So what do I mean by that? Well, we're in the camera tab right now and you can see these little four layers on the side with an eye at the top. These are called the art layers, okay? Now if you click these in the camera view, it doesn't really do anything because even if you click the eye, you can't see any changes because the camera view is doing what's called composite everything together, compositing. It's, it's basically uh, combining everything that you see on screen. If we click on the drawing tab though, you may have come across this before, maybe in one of my other videos or maybe online elsewhere, but basically the drawing view takes that drawing off from underneath the camera and allows you to look at it. It's like taking it off from underneath the camera and putting it back on the animation desk. Now we're only looking at the line art here. As we click through these, you can see there's four different art layers. So like the traditional um, cell drawings and things, this would be like four layers of cell. And this eye at the top allows you to see all of them, no matter which one you have selected. So it's handy to just reference other layers. At the moment, I have my color on the same layer as my line art. Now this might not be that handy. I'm just going to delete it. I've got the black selection arrow selected. I'm going to just click on it and press delete. The reason why you might want to put it on the color art layer on its own is say you're wanting to do some shading and you want or you're wanting to use the color of something to um, mask out something else. You sometimes need those things separated out. You can bring the line art to the front if you want to. So it's a good thing to get used to is coloring, especially for hand-drawn animation, coloring your actual color of your artwork on a different layer. Now, what's the easy way to do this? Well, the long way is obviously going to be filling these things in and then selecting them, shift select, and then cutting and going to the new layer and pasting. That is going to take you an age. So we want to avoid that if we can. Now, Toon Boom um, luckily has a very handy button that does this for you. If you look on your tool properties, whilst you have the black selection arrow selected, in the tool properties tab, we have this button, create color art from line art. So if we click it once, it doesn't look like it's done anything. But then we go to the color art and voila, we have lots of what's called strokes. So it's um, if you press the K key on your keyboard, it will toggle them on and off. And they are invisible strokes. They're things that the software just recognizes to hold. Well, they're invisible lines, not invisible strokes. But they're, they're things that the software uses to hold fill in. So it's like creating, putting a piece of rope around something, um, filling it in with some paint, and the paint stays inside the rope, and then you move the rope away. Terrible analogy, but basically you can see when you press K, it turns it on and off. Now, what does this do? And First of all, let's talk about these little yellow boxes. But what it does is basically contain your fill. These yellow boxes are saying, this, the software is saying, look, I think there's a gap here. Now you see how this, this arm ends here. Well, there is a gap, but it's luckily filled elsewhere. This gap here might be more of a problem. So if I zoom right in, you can see I've got a tiny little gap. So I'm going to go and click and hold on my paint bucket, use the close gap tool, and it's just closed it. Now, if you look at the the line art, that's, you know, even though it's not perfectly straight, we've zoomed right in and it's working fine. So you can use the same on here in this tiny little gap. Now, you don't always have to close them. You can change what's called the, the um, what should we call it? I want to say fidelity. Uh, the kind of like the margin for error on the fill. When you've got the paint bucket tool, you have this zero to, to 10. So Zero means it won't close any gaps, and 10 will close bigger gaps, okay? So you can see it's putting a little blue line across there. Um, obviously, if it's set to zero, but everything's all closed up, uh, you're going to be fine anyway. So the good thing about these little yellow boxes is they appear no matter how far zoomed in or out you are, which makes it very easy to spot the gaps. Um, sometimes they are false positives, shall we say. Um, this is a... Uh, this is kind of like not going to cause any issues. That one might do a little bit, just tiny little 
arrow. You can also use the white contour arrow to just snap it in. But if you've got the snapping magnet tool turned on in the tool properties as well, it's going to help even more. So that's how you go through and adjust all these things. And that is going to make it really, really easy for me to have the color art selected. I can do this back in the camera view now. I can press K to hide those strokes and make it easier to, to see what I'm doing. And I can fill in all my gaps. And sometimes you have to zoom in a bit to get it right. But um, you can see that it's just putting them, if I press K, I've just got my fill, which is really cool. And then the line is on a separate layer. So that's really handy. One tiny little last thing. If you hold down Shift and click this button, you've got options here for um, using the rendered version of the drawing, which is obviously going to have um, maybe some slightly smoother lines in there, maximum re resolution for the rendered image. Um, there's all kinds of things about threshold and so on. Don't tend to worry about those too much myself. But this is the important one, the source layer and the destination layer. So if your line art isn't on the line layer, it's on the overlay. You can change this to overlay and you can change where it goes to. Also, clear destination art layer first is important because just to click on that, if there's the tiniest bit of artwork on that layer, it won't work. So you need to make sure that's um, turned on when you do this. And you can also perform line art to color art operation immediately. Now, line art to color art is confusing if you've picked overlay to underlay that's going to still do overlay to underlay. It's not going to do line art to color art. It's just the name of the tool. It's a bit confusing. But we want this on because if we press OK, you're going to have to, and you don't have that turned on, you're going to have to press that button again. OK? It's going to remember your settings as well. So when you press OK, this now, if I shift click on it, it's remembered those settings. So you need to remember to reset that. Otherwise, it's going to be um, exactly what you said it last time. I hope those tips have been useful. It should save you a lot of time with, uh, with hand-drawn animation, and hopefully you understand a little bit more about how to use this, this palette down here. Um, I'm just going to very quickly talk about this scene palette. This scene palette here is just for this one palette. A lot of the time in professional animation studios, they will have a second palette. And you can, um, this one will be for the next character. So whatever this character is called, it will be called something and have its own colors. Notice how the software only shows you the colors of the palette you have selected. So it makes it much easier to focus on whatever character or element you are coloring at that time. Here we have the final version. I'm just going to quickly add a, another color, kind of call it the uh, jumper. I know if you're American, you probably call this a sweater, but you know, ifs and buts, and then I'm going to make it a slightly purple color. Now, if you want to know how to um, use a texture for this, watch my other video on coloring things in and talking about texture, because I'm going to show you some neat tips about how to keep the texture um, in its same sort of orientation. And we've got another video on, on gradients, so have a look at those. But uh, all that's left for me to do is say thanks for watching this video, and I hope you found it useful.